The Amazon, The Last Call. They go naked, the animal skins covering only their private parts, with bows and arrows in hand, making war like 10 Indians. An arrow struck me in the eye and passed through it. And because of that wound, I have lost the eye and I'm not without fatigue or pain. This is how Friar Gaspar de Carvajal reported in his diary the encounter that Orellana and his men had with the courageous Amazon women on June 24, 1542. These women bestowed a name on a river and majesty on a valiant feminine land, Amazonia. Some of its legendary fragrances were used to anoint and perfume legendary women. This is part of the story of ambition and coveted nature that we're going to tell you about today. The mother jungle has been and is betrayed by its children. This machinery spews out 6,000 tons of faulty tires, pure waste, on a yearly basis. We are not going to start our program off discussing ecological problems or pollution, although we could do so. We are going to talk about the crying tree, the rubber tree, or the caucho as the Mayas christened it, the tree from which the most common Western articles, like the balls the children play with, come from. And we're going to cover the suicidal and irrational story of the search for El Dorado in the Amazonian jungle. For Europe, the discovery of latex, the sap of the rubber tree, meant a revolution for Amazonia, one that we are still not capable of assessing today. The colonists took even more advantage of natives' knowledge and created industrial uses that would spread throughout the region in a misguided manner. In 1870, Barra, a village originally founded by the Portuguese, changed its name and rhythm. In the blink of an eye, the rubber industry turned this town into Manaus, the state capital and exporter of 3,000 tons of rubber. This metamorphosis was complete by 1900, when more than 20,000 tons of rubber left the port, thanks to the smoking techniques. By 1910, Manaus was no longer considered the Paris of the tropics, an emerald in the heart of the rainforest. The center of the world in the most distant place, in the middle of the jungle. Even so, Manaus had its own electric tram company, 10 private schools, 25 public schools, and the best library in all of Latin America. Manaus, with such economic wealth, lacked an opera house, and Eduardo Ribeiro, the governor at the time, had one of the most magnificent temples of Bel Canto built. Inaugurated in 1896, after 17 years of construction, this building, which cost $3 million at that time, became the symbol of a prosperous city. Piece by piece, its iron structure was brought in from Scotland, the stone came from Italy, and the 60,000 vitrified ceramic tiles, decorated with the colors of the Brazilian flag, which make the dome shine brightly, were imported from Alsace. Today, the Amazon theater is still an artistic caprice in the middle of a great natural wonder.
Let's leave the Amazon theater behind without forgetting that this was a customary stop for prestigious companies such as the Russian Ballet and even for Enrico Caruso, who crossed half of the Amazon to sing here, although he had to leave since jungle disease cut his tropical tour short. In 1915, Manaus reached the height of latex production. Eight million rubber trees were exploited throughout three million square kilometers of jungle. But 30 years prior, some seeds were stolen by the English and planted in Asia. The rubber tree adapts well to new environments, and it became difficult for Brazil to compete with the prices of this new producer. In the city of Faust, the set is taken down, and today we can appreciate a walk through Manaus, where wealth and desolation reached a par in a very short time. The appearance of a city that had everything thanks to the rubber industry, and one that lost everything when it all ran out. Thus, the first case of biopiracy ended the splendor of the Amazonian rubber industry. Today, that wildly successful business has been reduced to a few tire repair shops. Even the governor and father of the great metropolis, Eduardo Ribeiro, committed suicide since he was unable to assimilate the declining situation of the city. But the conquest of the jungle continues along its relentless path. Every day, thousands of people are ready to attack, and dozens of companies sponsor adventurers who want to immerse themselves in the heart of the Great River. It is calculated that 200,000 families make a living from rubber extraction and use this city as their center of operations. This shop was opened during the rubber boom, and today it preserves its importance, its class. The owner is 72 years old and has been working here for 60 years. Almost a century ago, his father came here from Syria with what he wore on his back and opened the shop. My father was young. He started from the bottom. Working at the bottom. Go, go, go. My father worked hard. Manaus had fewer homes at that time. Pretty ones. It had few homes. Then it started to grow. In Manaus, wealth spread fast. The shops sold a lot. I was selling 4,000, 5, 10,000 a day. And today, almost nothing. In the year 2000, present-day Manaus is the largest industrial producer of electrical components in Latin America. And its free trade zone makes it an almost perfect fiscal paradise, a good laugh at inflation. More than half of the televisions in Brazil are made here and they cost a third of their price in the rest of the country. In less than a century, Manaus has changed from being known as the Paris of the tropics to the Hong Kong of the Amazon. There are many treasure hunters wandering around here. The mysterious and powerful natural environment is still a big value on the rise. We will stealthily approach our next protagonist. For years, white men have come to lay waste to the Amazon jungle, as we can see here, sometimes in search of an odd El Dorado to be found through the indigenous cultures, in exceptional creatures such as this one. 
This small, extremely interesting frog is known as Phylomedusa bicolor, its scientific name. If I were to kiss it, like in the fairy tale, in search of a prince charming, my limbs would swell immediately. Its skin holds some interesting secrets for the multinational pharmaceutical companies. Certainly, if we kiss this Amazonian frog, we would quickly begin to hallucinate. And it wouldn't be difficult to see anyone within range turn into a psychedelic prince or princess. The secretion covering its skin is toxic, and the international laboratories know it. The genus Phylomedusa, which this frog belongs to, is characterized by its mucus, from which specialists have been able to isolate 300 bioactive compounds. The poison from the skin of this animal is 27 times stronger than morphine. Knowing this, in January of 1998, Abbott Laboratories, one of the world powers in the pharmaceutical and chemical sector, announced the marketing of a new compound, ABT-694, derived precisely from an existing toxin in the body of one of these tiny animals. The final result was a new generation of analgesics able to replace opium derivatives to fight against chronic pain and a booming business of $500 million. The Amazon region, however, does not receive a single dime from the profits. The Philomedusa has two colors just like other frogs and toads, just like this marine toad from Amazonia, a genus found all over the world. It has been introduced in Australia and, like other toads and frogs, its skin has poisonous glands, you know, chemical substances that are poisonous. Young people in Australia have begun to use it as a hallucinogenic drug. These are the parotid glands, which are poisonous like some other glands, but the poison is concentrated here. And sometimes the young people grab the frogs and lick them. Then, if this substance is ingested in small doses, it's hallucinogenic. But that's very dangerous because swallowing a lot of it is fatal. As with dogs, dogs often bite the frogs and swallow the poison. Alkaloids are very dangerous and they often die. The batrachotoxin that accumulates on the skin of these delicate little frogs is the most powerful substance of non-protein origin found in nature to date. The dendrobates are only trying to ward off predators. But every year, thousands of these creatures are captured in the Amazon and taken to different laboratories around the world. Some labs will pay over $250 for just one frog, which they could have bought for less than $1 in any village. Recently, a German man carrying 550 specimens was arrested in the Sao Paulo airport. One of the specimens confiscated is in this picture. We were able to donate them to the university. He was taking them to uh, Germany and Holland. Their final destination was most likely a laboratory to analyze their main biological components. Uh, there are also cases of biopiracy with some plants. For example, in the case of some natural active elements, uh, there are times where a large pharmaceutical laboratory will spend as much as, even as much as $300 million on research uh, until they will finally find a product which is achieved and they feel that they can put on the market.
Although the results of the research favor human health, the massive exportation methods, and above all, the acquisition of wealth at the cost of the countries of origin, is atrocious. It's a good idea to ask some questions which have never been answered. Who owns the patents on these discoveries? And thus, who should benefit from them? Land isn't the only thing stolen from the indigenous peoples. Their knowledge is too. And all the pharmaceutical products on the market that we have referred to were naively revealed to big companies, which today patent this alien but lucrative information. The natural medicines of the Amazonian natives are being bottled and sold by multi-millionaire bio-hijackers. For example, a biological bactericidal and cicatrizant ointment is extracted from the venom of this rattlesnake, which means a pharmaceutical revolution for substituting traditional stitches. The Tucanos, Araras, and Yanomanis have known about the virtues of snake poison for centuries and have shared their knowledge with biologists paid by laboratories. They cannot imagine that these snakes are worth $20,000 in Singapore. Let's go back to the story of our frog. The Phylomedusa's poison is a hard drug. I had the opportunity to try it. Uh, to have that experience here in Amazonia through someone called uh, Mestre, who lived with the Indians for a long time, 14 years. He had what is known as a vaccine, which is the secretion that he placed on a stick and preserved it like that, dehydrated. He brought it and applied that vaccine to many people. And I was there accompanying him to see what happened and to learn a little bit more about it. I was out of it for a while, a few minutes, and then regained consciousness and began to realize where I was. But I did hallucinate and I did not enjoy it. I felt like I lost one or two liters of water in just minutes. Really, I sweated it out through my skin. Like this zoology professor, we also like to cross the thin line that separates theory from practice and walk kilometers, miles of virgin river in search of the experience. Seduced by the story of our little frog, we wanted to verify if, as we believe from the beginning, the big multinational pharmaceutical companies had taken advantage of the Amazonian Indians' knowledge. We traveled for days until we reached the stretch of river shared by Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. The Tacuna Indians live here in settlements on the riverbanks where evangelization left its mark and where this ethnic group, even with a maximum degree of cultural adaptation, maintains some traditional uses and customs. The scientific name Phylomedusa, the name recognized around the world, is substituted here by bakor, or health frog, which is what generations of Takunas have called this frog for centuries. Today, some important members of the settlement are going to show us the properties that so many laboratories claim to have discovered. The most surprising thing is to see how these Catholic natives blend such a pagan ritual with the symbol of the cross that hangs from their necks. The frogs were captured this evening, but without hurting them. They cannot live in captivity, however, or they will die. They stop producing their magical alchemy when they lose their freedom. 
Under a tree, with a gas lamp, they are heating up some wooden needles, which they will use to scratch their wrists. This is where the frog poison will penetrate the body through osmosis. Three minutes are enough to notice the effects. Yatul squeezes the parotid glands of the animal, as if it were a tube of medicine. He administers the doses to his friends, who have Spanish names, but dark native skin like his. Slowly, Angelo, Manuel and Benito begin to succumb to the power of the frog venom. We are attending the same ritual that some biologists sent here by multinational pharmacy companies witnessed a few months ago according to what the villagers have told us. They paid them less than two dollars for each frog and took away two sacks full. <laughs> its purpose is not just to obtain the hallucinogenic effect, the natives use the frogs when they have serious headaches, chronic pains, or diarrhea. It is an efficient remedy, and mothers also give it to their children for certain illnesses. The dosage is calculated by the adults, since they know that more than three scratches on the wrist could kill them. For some, this frog is the end of laziness apathy. You're up. You feel strong. You feel happy. You have only made one scratch, but they have told us that there are people who make more than one, more scratches. Could a person die from many of them? If you make many scratches this way, you die, for sure because it's a very strong poison. At, at first my head hurt, then my head seemed to be flying, uh, and then my stomach began to, to turn and feel really strange until finally I, I, well, I threw up. In, in just a few minutes, it was over, and now I feel much better. I feel very strong and happy. And now I feel much, much better. After this lesson in natural medicine, just another one on environmental education, the frogs are set free. Thou shalt not kill is the only command that fully coincides with their culture. The indigenous peoples are also being pursued by biotechnological companies in an attack called biopiracy. People disguised as ecologists, wearing environmental protection t-shirts, are getting close to the shamans, uh, the pajas, the curacas, the medicine men of the 180 indigenous cultures in the case of Brazil. They are trying to appropriate their knowledge in the same way as if someone tried to patent a host in uh, Christian culture. As if someone from the Amazon went to Spain or the United States and patented something so sacred to us as the host. In the Amazonian world, there are also sacred things, active living beings that have been living in an orderly manner for millions of years, long before the DNA of our species even came about. Here and there, you will find every color, shape, aroma. 80% of all plant species on Earth spread over the heart of the tropical jungle. In an area that occupies the equivalent of one city block, in one hectare of Amazonian terrain, we could identify up to 300 different species of trees. In France, for example, in this same space, we could only identify 50.
This is what Amazonia is like. Disproportionate and fascinating, gigantic but delicate. A tree belonging to the Papilionaceae family, with wood as red as burning embers, gave Brazil its name. The vegetation and the republic are united to that extreme, and to that extent, the future of the great Brazilian nation should be the same as that of the Palo Brazil tree. But oblivious to history and etymology, the thieves of living things feel at home here, calculating every corner of this jungle as if trying to figure out the best way to make the most profit. The plant kingdom is at the service of mankind, feeding him involuntarily with every strike, an economic empire that shows no consideration, only dividends. Since the white man arrived in the Amazon, many have given their lives in order to interpret its natural message, to reveal its hidden secrets. Some famous botanists died here, classifying unknown plants in remote places. Their intentions were almost always good, to learn in order to preserve. But sometimes their research lighted the way for those who are only interested in making big money. For them, the Palo Brasil tree, the rubber plant, and the cocoa tree were only useful on supermarket shelves, labeled with big brand names, but not as a part of an ecosystem which depends on a subtle and indispensable balance. While I observe these plants of much economic interest for the Amazon, I remember the problem of biopiracy, which is unfortunately devastating the Amazonian region. Plants from Amazonia are used by many international laboratories, but the profits from this never, usually never make it back here. This is why we now have laws to protect our plant resources. We certainly achieve a legal and fair use of the resources of Amazonia through these rules and these new regulations. When Adolfo Duca, the famous botanist to whom we owe the names of many Amazonian trees, discovered this tree, Marilyn Monroe had not yet been born. The Pau Rosa captivated the scientist with the wonderful aroma that its bark gave off. He christened it with the scientific name, Aniba Rosai Odora. Many decades later, Monroe would admit to covering her nude body every night with little splashes of Chanel No. 5, surely without knowing that her skin was being perfumed by this Amazonian essence. Thus, a simple tropical tree gave glamour to the goddess of the movie screen. Monroe would still have been beautiful without Pau Rosa, but thanks to its discovery, her legend grew like the Amazon does during the rainy season. From a queen to Victoria Regia. That is how Richard Schomburg, an English botanist, named the largest water lily on the planet 160 years ago. He honored his queen and dishonored the native people, who had already named the plant many centuries before.
Recently, they not only steal the names of the Amazonian plants, but also the space for them to grow and survive. In 1999, Amazonia lost 1,700,000 hectares, an area larger than the U.S. state of Hawaii and similar to that of Navarre and the Spanish Basque Country together. When faced with flames, the charming forest seeds the scarred terrain to more profitable plants. The state of Mato Grosso should be renamed since it is quickly losing the dense forest that gave it its name. Each year, it looks more like the vast plain of La Mancha in Spain than a tropical forest region. Agriculture is its assassin. It exhausts its fertile land very quickly, just as the gentlemen of the soybean industry have planned. On these plains, maybe the hardest and least known battle is being fought by those interested in defending the Amazon region. The Brazilian government disguises this dilemma as an ambiguous form of protection to justify development. Rainforest or soybeans, it's that simple. Today, Brazil is second only to the USA as the world's leading producer of this plant, which feeds our pigs and chickens and seasons our exotic dishes. Some birds found only in Brazil, such as the emu, are also attracted by this green revolution, but they do not have a rainforest to hide or reproduce in. During the 1960s, 432,000 hectares of soybeans were cultivated in Brazil, and today, 13 million. This plant, of Chinese origin, has taken over this virgin territory. The states of the Amazon, Rondonia, Acre, Roraima, Maranhão, and Tocantins, are changing their appearance in order to secure agricultural wealth, which has no territorial limits at the moment, but many interested international parties. In Mato Grosso and Rondonia alone, the World Bank has invested $469 million. The big plantations also produce enormous profits for the owners, but very few jobs. This single crop agriculture is mechanized, and the average number of workers is only two per hectare. The devastated land of the rainforest is very poor, and it has to be excessively stimulated with chemicals in order to produce at the rate of market demand. Thus, in the opinion of many experts, Within a few decades, it won't be difficult to apply the axiom that our species pursues. Soy today, hunger tomorrow. These beans will travel from the interior of Brazil to the ports of Osaka, Liverpool, Rotterdam, and Hamburg. The company Maggi, the king of soy, is responsible. It is the largest soy producer in the world. This family clan from Italy bought its first estate here in 1979, and today it controls the agriculture of several Brazilian states, as well as an annual turnover of millions and millions of dollars. This year, they have exported 1.1 million tons of soy, and its financial group is made up of 13 companies. After hard negotiations, we were able to interview one of the founder's sons, as well as to give him an opportunity to defend the company against the ecological accusations. He didn't waste his time, the best defense is a good offense, judge for yourselves. I assure you that we cannot give in. Brazil cannot abandon its estates, plains, forests, the places where high production is possible. Abandon it in the name of conservation? Preserve nature for what? In Europe and the United States, in the more developed countries, everything has already been done. There are no forest reserves, their rivers are not completely navigable, and they want to step on the rights of Brazil. 
the rights of the Mato Grosso, the rights of our citizens. And they want to use our natural potential exclusively for preservation. Well, we think this is way to pressure Brazil, so we won't create the necessary infrastructures and so we won't be competitive on the international market. Because this way, if we were competitive and the world consume more food than what is produced at this time, prices will drop and the European and American governments will have to raise their taxes. Therefore, without a doubt, this whole ecological movement, the ecologists, is on their payroll. Cuiabá is also the city that is home to Senator Vincente Vuolo, an old friend of the Magis, their unshakable associate and the father of the railroad. After 30 years of political struggle, this railway fanatic, as you can see throughout his stylishly decorated office, Hello. has managed to build more than 5,000 kilometers of train tracks, which will transport 10 million Hello. tons of soy a year beginning in 2003. This infrastructure is unlike any other in the world. Paid for exclusively by the agribusiness companies, Brazil hopes to use it to triple the economic benefits but also the environmental effects of the country's large-scale farming. Will the spirit of the rubber plantations return to Brazil? Now, in the senator's opinion, it's time to dream about a new version of the El Dorado myth. A new century has begun in Mato Grosso, the century of the train. We were living in the century of rubber, of precious stones, we had the foundations of progress and development. But now progress is waiting for us in the next century. With large-scale production, which we are going to have in every city and in every state. Mato Grosso is going to change completely. We are going to change Brazil to a granary state. I have absolutely no doubt about it. The Guarani Cayoa Indians are crying for their dead on the last stretch of land that they have. They do not have anything to celebrate about. Pitiful and humiliated, they only pay tribute to their dead. It's not their first funeral. The splendor of El Dorado, coveted by white men, is as dark as death to them. From this village, the euphoria of Senator Vuolo seems pathetic to us. We are in Parambizinho, the land of suicide. According to the Constitution, the Cayua are Brazilians with full rights. But when our cameras visited their settlement, 308 people had committed suicide within the last 13 years since it is impossible to continue living here. These are the graves of the last three Indians who took their lives one week ago. For Elaine at 13, Luis at 16, and Mauricio at 19, the soy business was the curse that took them to the grave. Even this small sacred area where their dead are buried is threatened by the farming machines. I 
I, I don't know. My daughter's other friend died down there. And then my daughter came here. My 15-year-old daughter took the poison with her friends. They took the poison out of the house. But then, but then she collapsed here. She came home, she came here to die. She was already dead when she came here. Cleoncia has only this one daughter left and a very dark future to raise her in. These are difficult times. I'm going to stay where my son is. He's buried here, here under this land. My father lives here, and my mother is also buried in this area. I have to live here. The children are buried here. My children are buried here. This is Mauricio. Here is my son, and here's my little girl. The soybean crop intervenes in the extinction of these people to this extent. The pesticides used to fight plant diseases on the soy are what the Indians use to poison themselves. No one takes the blame. Time passes, and the rainforest and the native Brazilians are being wiped out. There is no place for them in a developed Brazil, although with a little bit of luck, they may receive a handout. We have an agreement with the Indians. We understand that the entire region earns more money, and it is not possible that only they live in misery. Therefore, we pay them a toll for every truck, every car that passes through their land. Thanks to this money, the Indians are able to take care of their health, buy what they need. And as well, they create some infrastructures to live better. Thus, our relationship with indigenous people in Mato Grosso is the best one possible. With mutual respect between the Indians and the state owners, and the state owners and the Indians. Is the generous king of soy referring to this unfamiliar mansion? Or this luxurious spa? 200 years ago, the Guarani Cayua Indians occupied 25% of the land in Mato Grosso, an area similar to Portugal or Indiana. Today, the 25,000 men and women of this ethnic group occupy less than 1% of this territory, living confined to tiny reserves, a space equal to 60 soccer fields. It's impossible to keep fighting. There are too many broken dreams and not enough vital space for survival in the future. The National Foundation for the Indians makes futile demands that the settlers leave the native people's lands and that the situation be corrected despite social prejudices. Uh, is it possible for the Indians to survive this culture shock that we are experiencing right now with this population density? They need land space, but that isn't going to reduce soy production in any way, not even for the settlers. They say that the Indians are going to throw them off their land, but they're not talking about the settlers in general, just the 38 colonists within the Indian village, not the others. They're outside of the village boundaries, and they wouldn't have any problems. The world of soy has already strangled other ethnic groups such as the Shavante, the Enawenenawe, and the Terena. Exhausting natural resources in Amazonia is much more heartless than in other natural areas around the world. We've said it before, here the rainforest has become human. Whoever wants to destroy the jungle to do business will have to murder the people living there. He will lead a certain genocide. The youths of Panambizinho, disoriented and hopeless, make it easy for the settlers and take their own lives. The statistics are horrifying. Between the ages of 12 and 18, there have been 123 suicides. 
and between 18 and 24, 63. That means 65% of all suicides take place before the age of 25. Among all these young Indians, this girl was saved. The orange juice was stronger than the pesticide that she tried to kill herself with. Miraculously, the doctors were able to save her. The settlers have completely destroyed the rainforest, their source of life. The rest of the tribe lives confined on a reserve that is not surviving either. We don't know how long they will want to continue to live. We only know that the smiling faces of the Indians are needed by this tortured land. She had been saving the poison for two months. She was working for an estate owner here on the land for very little money, and the owner was afraid she would poison herself. He had the poison hidden, but she knew where it was. She found it and divided it among the three of them. There were three of them. Two women and a man. All the three of them died. My friend always talked about the land. She would say, I want to get married, but how am I going to get married if I don't have a place to build a new home? She would speak hopefully about marrying her man, but, but they didn't have a place to live. She was obsessed. She said that she would come live with me. She always talked to me. She told me everything. She always talked to me. We don't want to move to another area. We want our land. Our land and no other. We don't want to go anywhere else. I tried to commit suicide and I will try again if this continues. Suicide is like a cry for help. The Indians are disorganized. Hunting and fishing doesn't exist, or even land. Good education or good medical services. The Indians do not have plantations or receive a salary at the end of the month. They don't work and don't have the resources to do so. Therefore, suicide is the way to ask the authorities for help, because due to this lack of organization, they cannot live in a traditional manner, with the harmony that unites them with nature. The past will never return, since the settlers, the white society, the estate owners have destroyed practically all the natural resources that existed in these villages. The Kiowas are demanding what is fair, at least 1,240 hectares of the traditional lands that belong to them according to the law. Systematically, in the last 30, 20 years, everything that was not an indigenous area has been demolished. Everything that doesn't form part of the indigenous area, which is the Parisi area, which is good for agriculture, is completely besieged by single crop farming companies. Thus, it is producing a great impact on the economy and on the natural resources of these settlements. It is a very important issue because everything that is not considered an indigenous area is being invaded and ecologically destroyed. Like the redskins who live in the north, 
They live on reserves, cornered with no way out. These people do not have a lot to celebrate since the so-called discovery of Brazil 500 years ago. Misery has discovered them. On the threshold of a new century, an activity such as agriculture, which once gave man dignity, has become a poisonous weapon of destruction. First, there was the rubber plant, then gold and wood, and now soy. Economic arguments for devastation without scruples. After visiting this besieged reserve, it's time for reflection. The great producer of soy, the giant of the Mercosur common market, is also a country where 60% of its inhabitants suffer malnutrition. Brazil should do everything it can to change this situation if it really wants to be called a modern country.